morning. We're here with Professor Barbara Moran uh, in the School of uh, Information and Library Science at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. Welcome, Barbara, and thanks for being with us. Thank you for inviting me to participate. Well, let's begin with uh, 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 just a, a little bit of uh, background. Tell us a little bit about the many roles you, you play here at, uh, at UNC and, and at SILS in particular. Well, I've been at SILS a long time. SILS was the first job I had after I got my PhD in Buffalo, and I came in 1981 as a, well, actually as an instructor. I hadn't quite finished my PhD. And I have been here throughout my professional career, and I've gone up through the ranks. I spent um, almost nine years as dean, which was a, an interesting thing for people who teach management well, because... Thank you for hiring me. Yes, <laughs> that's right. We, <laughs> one of my best decisions. <laughs> but. Uh, but um, I've, I've done a lot of things here. I've really enjoyed my entire time here. I've had opportunities to go elsewhere, but I've always thought, you know, who would ever leave SILS? Because there's such good people, and it's such a good university that supports this school so well. I think the things I've enjoyed most are the teaching, and I've really enjoyed my research, which has expanded over the years, mostly looking at people and organizations in various types of management roles. I remember when I came, Ed Holly was a dean, and he told me, he said, don't do any service until you get tenure. You'll have plenty of time to pay your debt to, prof to your profession after then. And I think for the last, especially since I've been dean, I've been doing a lot of service to the university on a lot of committees. But it's a good way to get out and really see the university as a whole. So I've, en I've enjoyed that also, although I must admit it takes too much time. And I vow each year I'm going to get off all these committees, but somehow I end up saying I'll do the another one. So I've, I've done a lot of things here, but uh, mostly teaching and doing research and working with students. So, so um, we, we certainly appreciate uh, all the, the, the ways that you represent SILS uh, both on campus and, and, and beyond. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this, uh, this teaching. Uh, you, you've been sort of our, our lead on our uh, management class and I, I know you have a, a uh, new version of, a, of the, the, the primary book in the field on management. Uh, tell us your, about your philosophy of management and uh, you know, how, does it, how do you play it out in your classroom? Well, I was hired here to teach the management class and at that point the classes here were being taught, at, all the introductory students were taught in a class called the block. Mm -hmm. And anyone who graduated here from about 15 years would talk about the block. They all started in the fall. They were always, they, all the classes were in that large lecture room, 209 in Manning Hall. And everyone was in the same class together. All the classes, t er, the one class encompassed all the introductory material. So I started off teaching management in this very large classroom to all the in introduction reads, all the inter uh, incoming students. And from the very start, when I was teaching management, what I always wished I could do was have a laboratory. I wish somebody would give me an organization, a library, almost any type of organization, and let the students run it. But it's, you know, it's impossible. Nobody lets you have that. A lot of the students see management in action. They see good management and they see bad management in their internships, in their prior life, in, in their part-time jobs. But there's no place that they can actually practice being managers. So one of the things I've tried to incorporate into the class, and I've done this more and more through the years, is more experiential exercises. I've tried to come up with ways that we can put in case studies, simulations, um, various types of um, activities that can be done in the class so that the students can at least have a feel of what it's like to be a manager. I guess the other thing about management that everyone who teaches management now knows about is that more everybody goes out to work in teams. So how can you, within a classroom, teach people to function as members of teams? I don't think being a team member comes naturally to a lot of people. All through our lives we've worked individually and suddenly we get to a point where we're put in a team. And how do you how do you make a group of people work together well in a team? And I think management classes also can provide an opportunity for that. So as part of this new this new book that just came out, um, the, the Library and Information Center Management mm -hmm. has, um, well, it actually has a whole new uh, chapter on teamwork. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, there are a lot of management games, simulations, case studies that I put on a website that I hope people will be able to use. Because I believe the more students have a chance, management, I, well, management, I myself do not think is unlike anything else. I don't think people learn how to be managers by listening to somebody talk about it. Right. You have to do it. And so I think if students have a chance to go to a, a place that there are simulations, there are case studies, there are things that they can do to actually practice being a manager, making the type of decisions managers make, it, it will help them in the long run. 
so um, on this on this website, uh, is, uh, students would go and do a simulation uh, as as group members together. Or? I don't, you know, I Gary, I don't really know how it's going to be used. We had a, a website, but it was a much smaller website mm -hmm. with the last edition. But I I think this I I noticed with some of the other management textbooks, the the websites are being kept. Um, if you don't buy the book, you can't have access to the website. Oh, okay. But ours is going to be freely available. Oh, great. And I think that people maybe who even don't use a textbook will be using the website. But I, I don't know whether faculty members will bring it in as part of the class, whether they will just send students to it. I imagine it will be used in lots of different ways. And one of the things that I put up on the website, um, and I say I, but actually Bob Stewart and I have been working on this whole project together, was an um, invitation for other people to teach management to consider putting some of their material up on the site oh, so that we could actually have a, a common area for people who teach management in schools like this right. that we could pull together our best case mm -hmm. studies and our best simulations and, and see what we could do to develop to make it really even more useful. So, so um, one of the, uh, the activities I know I've heard the students talk about uh, uh, is, is the, I guess, the, the uh, unofficial uh, title is the ropes course. T tell us a little bit about the, the ropes course experience. Uh, well, I really, it, I really am a proponent of things like ropes courses. It's a team building experience and actually the formal name is the Carolina Challenge course here. And it's a very good, um, I, I think it's a wonderful opportunity for, for a class, especially a large class at the beginning of the semester, to begin to learn one another as people outside of classes. Imagine, I, I've I, for two years, I, t I went back to that experience of teaching management in a very large class, about 70 people. Mm -hmm. So imagine 70 new students coming in. They really don't know one another. Unfortunately, but because of the way classrooms are set up, typically you sit in rows so that, you know, if you're, n if you're in the front, you don't know anybody behind you. And you sometimes turn around and look at people, but typically you just don't get to know people very well. So you take these new people and you put them, take them on an outdoor activity, which takes about four hours. The, the ones that I have used, and they get together and they break into teams and they, they, they face challenges of various types. Some are physical challenges. There's a, a net of ropes and you've got to get everybody through the, the holes in the rope without touching the ropes and without saying anything. Oh, wow. There is a large seesaw sort of thing that you've got to get everybody on it so it perfectly balances without talking. And there are other things like, you know, just how do you roll um, a ball down the hill or put things through hoops and things like that, mostly with, without communicating. There's a, one with a long pipe that you have to, everybody has to hold a piece of pipe and you have to roll a whole series of golf balls through the pipe and make it all go in with, without falling out. And I think people, people come to see one another in a different setting. One thing, they're all out there in their casual clothes. We're all out there in our casual clothes. We're all hot because this usually is taking place in August. So, you know, we're, we're out there, we're, we're on the, the course together. And I think what they see is something that doesn't come out too often in, in classrooms. There's some people who are very good in the classroom, but who aren't so good at these things. That there's some people who never say a word in the class, but they get out there and they're just able to contribute so much to this. And I believe they look at people differently. And it also, you, you, will, you get to know people so much better that way. So it's a good way to introduce, I think, people, students, especially in a large class, to, to working in a team and to, to seeing one another as individuals. That's that's a that's a great um, uh, example of, of, of why I think um, our students uh, um, like the management class, even though it's one of our required courses that, that uh, you know yeah. often tend to be um, groaned about. Uh, it, it's true that you know I've always thought it was odd that management is people don't see the value of management classes. Now, obviously, since somebody I, since I teach it, I, I see the value of it, and I think everyone should want to take it. Right. But I often get beginning students in there who'll tell me, you know, from the first, that they're never going to be managers. Why are they taking this class, and why is this a required class? And I, I think that by the time they get out in the work world a couple of years, they realize why they took it. But um, as you know, almost all of our graduates are managers. Typically, in their first job or two, they're, they're managers. Right. And if they've managed to escape being a manager, they're going to be managed. And I think it's good to have had management because then you'll learn about the management techniques that are being used on you. But I, more and more I think students now realize the, the value of management classes, although you still get people who, who've grown about it. If you look at the schools like this across the, the United States, almost all of them offer management classes. I think all of them offer at least one management class. But it's not required in, in many 
And I, I think that's sort of a shame because we, we are all going to be managers. And as the students who come into the school, they go to so many different settings. And I think a lot of people who come in think it's going to be a class in library management. Ah, right. But I think that when you teach management, it doesn't matter. Ma all management is alike. I think the management class I teach here will be the same that will be taught, say, to beginning students in the School of Business. Mm -hmm. Because management is management. The settings we practice management in differ. And obviously, one of the big ones in, in this field is the difference between the profit making and the nonprofits. I mean, right. between people who actually go to libraries, which are publicly supported, and the ones who go to the corporate world. But even that is just a bottom line difference where people get the money, and there are often differences in how people are, you know, some of the differences in, in hiring practices and how people are treated, and some of the benefits and things like that. But really, they're just surface differences. And when you get down to it, managers in every type of organization do exactly the same thing. So I, you know, I, I think it's fairly easy to teach people that are going into both the corporate and the, the nonprofit world about management. And I really think it helps the students too because they, ha they have two different perspectives. Oftentimes we get people in the class who've had long experiences in the corporate world mm -hmm. and they really are able to bring a lot to the, to the class that pe other people don't know about. One of the things that uh, came out of um, our um uh, sort of strategic planning, um, 70th anniversary uh, uh, efforts this, this last year, what was the corporate people who we brought in, uh, as well as the uh, high-level uh, li library administrators, uh, saying that management is really important uh, for, for students and that they really need more of it. So it's, uh, uh, it's interesting that you know, we have this history of, 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 of trying to provide this, this kind of um, training for leadership, really, and, and um, hopefully this will continue to, to, to grow in the years ahead. Uh, the, the, the management class is, is sort of uh, you know, just one of your classes. Uh, are there, there are other things that uh, you, you, you teach, uh, and there's, uh, I want to ask you about uh, some of your research, because I know you've been uh, working with the uh, Bodleian Library uh, for a number of years and have a really interesting uh, um, a monograph uh, uh, underway on that as well. So, uh, you want to talk about some of the other classes? Sure. Um, I guess th there are two other classes I'd like to talk about that I really enjoy teaching. One that I'm going to teach, um, a class I teach almost every fall, in, well, sometimes in the fall and sometimes in the spring, is a course in popular materials. Mm -hmm. And this is a course primarily designed for people who are going into public libraries, but a lot of people going into other types of libraries also take it because of popular reading collections in academic libraries. Right. And it looks at all the various types of popular material and their place in the world. I mean, it, and it goes beyond printed material to look at things like videotapes and MTV and all the various types of cultural, popular cultural influences that are on our society mm -hmm. and, and what role they play in libraries and what libraries should do to support them. I, you know, 20 years ago, no, no libraries had things like, well, they had, some of them had tapes, right. books on tape, but now to look at the, the multimedia offerings offered right. by all libraries, the fact that our own state library provides that net library so that people can download books. There's just so many more ways that we can, I think, enjoy and appreciate popular materials. So that's a class I really do like. And I think the students like it too because every week we cover a genre. So one week we'll be reading mysteries and one week we'll be reading science fiction and one week we'll be reading romances. Right. That, that always is a little bit hard for the guys in the class when they have to read a romance. But um, they, they get through it and I think they maybe learn something from it. Another class I teach is academic librarianship. And again, this is just a class that looks at a particular environment in which um, our students oftentimes go. And I teach it really as an environment course. I mean, I'm not teaching particularly management in there, but I'm teaching the environment of academic librarianship. So we all read the Chronicle of Higher Education every week, and we talk, spend a t time at the beginning of each class talking about what's going on in the world of higher education and how does that impact people who are working in libraries. And we try to look at the universities and colleges as a whole, their development, and, and the, the outside forces that influence them. Mm -hmm. And I've really been very lucky because every year I've taught that class, I've been able to have our provost come in and, and talk. And he or she mm -hmm. provides an upper level view of actually the university mm -hmm. here and some of the, the, some of the pressures that are on the people in the top academic positions in, in universities. And I think the students really do learn a lot from that. And they also see how much time and energy high academic officials 
spent thinking about the library and how important the library and oftentimes IT as a component part of that is in, in their thinking. So that's a course I enjoy. And a course I'm going to teach next spring for the first time is a course, um, I'm not exactly sure, I can't remember the real name of it, but it's on international affairs. Oh, so I'm okay. going to be looking, I'm going to be doing what's our so-called international course, mm -hmm. which I have, which has been taught before, but which I haven't done. And I really think I'm, I'm hoping that's going to be a, a chance to expose the students to the similarities, but the differences in information provision around the world. Yeah. And I, I'm really looking forward to that. Will you tie that in with uh, the study abroad and the various kinds of uh, pro um, uh, cooperative programs we have with um, you know, Charles University and with Oxford and, and others around the world? I hope we'll have some students from those programs that, are, that can be involved in it. And if we could get speakers, it would be great. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we would love to encourage students to go on some of our international exchange programs mm -hmm. because I really do think, you know, again, it's something you can talk about and talk about and you can experience it. And actually, um, I had a a friend t tried to argue with me that you could get an, a student abroad experience in Second Life. But you know, it <laughs> seems to me that, that maybe you could get something that was simulated. But there's something about being in a country, sort of by yourself usually on these things, you know, right. it, at least in the beginning, and learning that you can, you can get along even in a halting fashion in a place right. and, and adapt to a new culture, mm -hmm. which I think is really good. And it's, again, this plays back into the management because as everything is becoming so very globalized. I think it's terribly important for our students to get some sort of an idea that, you know, the world does not revolve around library and information practices in the U.S., right. but that there are many contributors mm -hmm. to what's going on out there. And I think, it, you know, it keeps us away from too much hubris because, I mean, we, we see that really it's, <laughs> we're just one, one player in the whole game. Well, I can I certainly see why you're such a, um, a, a popular and effective teacher. Um, uh, you've got interesting courses in your course. Uh, your passion for these things is, uh, shows. Um, tell us a little bit about the um, the, the Oxford program, and I, I, I know this is something that um, you know, you've been deeply involved with for a good, a good mm -hmm. number of years, and, and this research you've been doing. Well, this actually grew out of the, our international programs. I think when I was dean um, in the mid when was it? <laughs> I sort of <laughs> forgotten. I guess in the mid-90s, right. um, the, the, the Bodleian Librarian came over here and asked if we would become a partner in this program that they had, that we would have a seminar over there. We would sponsor a seminar, and the Bodleian would be a partner with us, and also Continuing Education at Oxford would be a partner, and we would get a group of people go over. And this is, we're now, oh, I think in our 16th or 17th year of sending people over, so we've been doing it. It's been a wonderful seminar. Every single year, people sign up and we fill it up and we send people over. And I was lucky enough to go two years fairly early on. I went, uh, one year I was scheduled to go, and the, la the other year someone couldn't go at the last minute and I stepped in. So I went over there and I found that I teach academic librarianship here, mm -hmm. but the academic libraries at, at Oxford there were so many differences. I almost couldn't recognize them as academic libraries. I mean, the, the language was the same, the books that were studied were the same, but the practices were so different. Mm -hmm. And with Oxford, the thing that most stood out was how fragmented the libraries were. There were over a hundred autonomous libraries on campus. And I mean, they all hired their own people, bought their own books and materials, I mean, set up their own rules. So they really were functioning autonomously. Mm -hmm. And there was a new library director hired in 1997, who was hired with the the mandate of, they called it integrating the libraries, bringing a large number of these libraries together. Now, not all of them, because the college libraries would still remain separate, because they were being funded separately. But there was to be a, created an Oxford University library system for the first time. So I, when he was, Reg Carr was, was the person who was hired, and so when he was n newly installed, I came over and I asked him if I could study the process. Mm -hmm. And he thought about it, and he said, well, he, he thought I could. And um, it, it has been fascinating research for me, because it's, it looks at organizational change. And I think anybody who has ever worked in an organization knows how hard it is to affect change, and to affect change so that people aren't left kicking and screaming. And how can you most effectively uh, make pain, lessen the pain that's involved? This was definitely a painful process because there was just 
so much tradition. I mean, things have been done this way for hundreds of years, and people all felt, and I think very rightly so, felt very great pride in their own individual library. And they were very concerned about the amalgamation and the putting them all together and, you know, who would lose status and who would lose power and who would, who was going to gain more from it and who would lose more. And, and it was such a, it was such a large library and there were so many players that one thing you saw demonstrated over and over again that no matter how much communication you did, it was never enough. I think one thing I learned from that is you just cannot over communicate when you're affecting change because even though people have email messages bombarded at them and memos and things like that, they only take in so much of it. And I think communication doesn't always work because I, it seemed to me that finally what people were wanting to hear communicated was that regardless of what happened, they were still important. Their libraries were still important. You know, they, 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 that what they had done had been valued. Exactly. And when you're making changes, it's sometimes hard to send out all those messages all the time. But to cut a very long story short, um, the, the uh, process is, is finished. It, mm -hmm. it is completed. It, it has gone through, and there is now an Oxford University library system, which is gradually adding more libraries. Um, it's it is working much better, I think, than the old one did. And the pain that was associated with it will be forgotten with time, I am sure. And uh, the people who were most affected by it, many of them are retiring. And new people coming in, I think, see the value of, of, the, of, of the new system. But it is just, I think for anyone who has to go in and do a huge change process like that, it, uh, I certainly do admire them because it, it was very difficult to do. And uh, Reg accomplished it. He was still standing at the end and he, he always said, you know, he had to win people's hearts and minds and it took a long time, but I think he, at least by the c conclusion, had convinced most people that what was being done was correct. And of course, the other big thing he had was the support of the university because the university itself was in a process of centralization and they did not have the funding to run this very autonomous and fragmented set library. So they were, it certainly was getting, pushing from the top to implement this. Well, that'll be a, a fascinating story to, uh, to read about. Uh, look forward to that. Well, I, I hope you will be able to read it soon. Yeah, yes. Um, w w you were, you were going to sh show us a, a couple of examples um, uh, from, from your, your website uh, and oh. your management. Yeah, I will. this this is not too important, but this is this is the website. It's put up by Libraries Unlimited, mm -hmm. and they, they're the ones who publish the book. And it's just they, there are case studies and budget case studies and management exercises, and then examples and web links of things. And a lot of case studies that either I have written, or my students have written, or other people have contributed, we've put those up. And budget case studies, I think, are really, I think, are terribly important because again. Students get out in the world and they have to handle budgets, oftentimes right. on their first job. And sometimes we've had students hired as directors of public libraries and suddenly they're completely in charge of the budget their first year. So these are, give students a chance to work with a group on formulating a budget, mm -hmm. meeting a budget situation, some sort of a problem, right. and then formulating a budget and then presenting a budget and trying to justify why they're asking for this additional money. Mm -hmm. So those are the budget case studies. The management exercises are various types. Um, one is a something called an in-basket exercise. And these are a couple that I have written, and in-basket exercises are great simulations. You are, typically, you just come back from a vacation, and there is a pile of stuff waiting on your desk. Right. Now, they used to call it in-basket because it used to all be paper. Sure. Now I have a lot of email messages right. in. But you come back from vacation, and students have, in class, 45 minutes to go through all these messages, prioritize which ones they would handle first, and briefly talk about what they would do. Great. So um, th th that's one, one type of exercise. And then, um, let's see, there are lots of examples. When, the first, when we did the first editions of this book, we had in the back of the book, we had many examples of things like um, organizational charts, mm -hmm. uh, strategic plans, that sort of thing. I, probably a third of the book was paper right. that was devoted to examples. Right. But now we have the examples on the web. We can just link in. Oh, and it great. certainly does yeah. save paper. And you can just, you know, you can go and you can see various types of organizations. This is the Kansas City Public Library Organization mm -hmm. chart. And you can see their org chart. Right. We also have a lot of strategic plans. We have a lot of um, 
various types of documents, union contracts, things like that, that managers really should be familiar with. Right. But you know, they, they, it's nice to have it in one place. Sure. One of the challenges is going to be keeping this up, this up to date. I looked at it, sure. you know, it just, it, we just got it up, and I was talking to the person who was working with right. Libraries Unlimited. A couple of the links are dead already, and she said they're going to run something that will check for dead links periodically once a month, and we'll try to keep it up to date. But right. I think that is going to be a challenge because, you know, the fluid nature of the web. It, it, it's fascinating to me that, that the book, as a uh, one of its, its nice properties, is that it, it's complete. I mean, it's, it has a beginning, it has an end, it has um, a scope uh, that, that's obvious and physical, whereas um, when you start to um, connect the two to web, websites, then they, they, there's just no end. And uh, uh, that's both exciting uh, and, and adds dynamics, but it also, I think, is a little bit daunting for the reader or the user because th there is no end. There is no end, and there's no end for the author, too. I mean, when you send in that manuscript, you think, well, this is it. And I, you know, and I, I sent it in, and when I sent it in, the, the minimum wage was still up in the air. They had not changed the minimum wage. And I wrote, and I said, at this point, you know, the minimum wage is still, and, but I knew it was going to be changed. Right. And so I'm, you know, so the great thing about the web is you can keep your book up to date. But as you say, it, it never it never does end, and I don't. I, I I think the way managers manage has been changed so much by the web. I mean, we all go as managers now to get so much of our information on the web, and you and you think about the use of information systems in management and how you know, even twenty twenty five years ago, you know, get your budget information on paper. I mean, everything was on paper. All your personnel records were on paper. I mean, it was, and I think management generally has has you know turned over now, and there is so much available online. But that also provides problems because, I mean, who has access to it? How do you keep privacy? I mean, you know, it, it, but yet think about the information that can be shared within organizations because it, people working there can have, have, all have access to the same information. I think about just the differences in how we advise students now and how we used to advise. We used to get our piece of paper and we used to do it. And now you can get online and find out everything about the student. You can, you know, it's, right. it's really just completely revolutionized, mm -hmm. well, management and I think scholarship too and teaching in schools like this. Well, um, this is a, it's a good example of um, of, of how uh, your your teaching, your your um, uh, attention to change and management um, all come together. Uh, you, you said something the other day that uh, struck me that, that that management is really a it's experience and and how difficult it is to bring experiences into the classroom. And I think the the web and uh, uh, and certainly these kinds of activities uh, and cases uh, are are your your approach uh, to trying to make that uh, experiential and uh, I'm sure the, the the students appreciate it and are better for it in the long run. I would love to do it even more. I'm, I, I'm signed up for that conference on games in education mm -hmm. and I think it would be wonderful if we could develop some games that could be used in teaching management. But I, and I, I'm not aware of any that are out there. Maybe, maybe there are some but um, I think that would be a wonderful thing that we could Beyond the old Sumer. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there is, there, there's <laughs> that. I mean, to plan. yeah, there, there's, there, there are those kind of things. But I mean, well, especially some that would be developed. You know, that would be specifically the type of management we'd want to teach in schools like sure. this. Yeah. I think that would be a lot of fun. I don't know. Sounds exactly. like some class projects. Yeah, I don't exactly know how to do it, but I, I guess maybe I can <laughs> see what I can learn from this conference, and maybe something could be done. That would be fun. Great. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? No, I, I, I began by talking about my time at Sills, and I, again, would just like to say that it's just been a great place to work. I think that's my colleagues, and it's, it's an exciting place here, I've always thought. I mean, there's a lot going on, a lot of people doing interesting things, interesting research. Great students always. Every year, I think, there can't be a better class of students than this one, and then next year, an equally good class comes in. So we really are, I think, blessed to be in a place like this, and it's... Um, I just look forward to, to teaching and doing some more research here. And maybe not doing quite so much committee work, <laughs> if, if, I, if I could do it. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to uh, your, your continued leadership here. Well, thank you.